Welcome to everyone again here. I'm very uh, glad to introduce our first speaker today, Fabio Serrani. He's a lecturer in ancient Greek literature and culture at the University of Leeds, specializes in ancient Greek philosophy and talk with particular emphasis in topics such as love, madness, and sanity, care and neglect, way of life, and the good life. His PhD was awarded in 2015 by Nova University of Lisbon with a dissertation on the concept of madness and lucidity in Plato's Petrus. His most recent publications include Mania and Aletheia in Plato's Petrus, published in 2020, and Misunderstanding Epimedeia Aletheia's Care for Petru in Plato's Eutidemus. Uh, which was published uh, by Springer in 2021. Uh, the title of his talk today is Philosophy as a Way of Life as a Mother of Life and Death, an Aristotelian take on a current debate. Fabio, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lucilla. It's quite an awkward title, I agree, as, as, um, but I will try to live with it. Uh, thank you for being here, and I will thank you, first of all, for your patience, because I am about to abuse it. So, uh, <laughs> right, let's begin. The place of Aristotle among the exalted ranks of philosophy as a way of life is, at least to me, a surprisingly contentious topic. While I do himself dedicate a whole chapter of his Caisse que la philosophie antique to Aristotle and his school, he does so starting from a defensive stance. At least according to uh, more common representations, Aristotle seems to contradict the fundamental thesis that philosophy was understood by the ancients as a way of life. What rescues Aristotle from being banished from uh, this exalted ranks uh, as a mere producer of philosophical discourses is the way in which he, according to our, um, in which, sorry, according to Ado, the philosophical activity engages in is integrated within his overall conception of the different ways of life. One might live for pleasure, one might live for politics, but the kind of life Aristotle associates with the highest good and greatest happiness for humankind is the one he himself partakes in, the life of philosophical research. And you will have noticed that I wrote this in the form of a preamble. I haven't noticed that before. Uh, the life of philosophical research, what Ardo designates as the selon l'esprit. For Ardo, therefore, the inclusion of Aristotle in this tradition is connected with the conception of the ideal way of life as understood within the Aristotelian version of the traditional Greek trope of the three ways of life, the three theo, the life of pleasure, the life of politics, and the philosophical life. Now, some prominent contributors to the current revival of the interest in philosophy as a way of life um, entirely exclude Aristotle from this tradition, at least in some of their um, um, contributions. This is the case of Sharp and Muir's uh, 2021 monograph survey of the history of philosophy as a way of life. And so, according uh, um, to Sharp and Muir, um, Aristotle proposes, and I'm quoting, a sole discussed conception of philosophy and a wholly theoretical conception of Sophia. This justifies its absence from the author's synoptical account of philosophy as a real life, since it belongs to a different strand of the philosophical tradition, a strand that engages predominantly to use Ado's terminology in philosophical discourse. In their brief mention of Aristotle, um, they refer to John Sellers' 2017 article, What is Philosophy as a Real Life? And in this article, Sellers contrasts two different conceptions of philosophy, the scientific and the mystic. Aristotle is, of course, an example of the scientific conception, while Socrates is an example of the humanistic. Only the latter corresponds to philosophy as a way of life as we understand here. As you, I'm sure, will have gathered by now, I disagree with this exclusion and believe that Aristotle deserves a place in our discussion of philosophy as a way of life, precisely because his thought contains a conception, or even several conceptions, of philosophy as a way of life. 
And although Seller has since uh, substantially revived his position regarding Aristotle, I think it is still fruitful to engage with the views and arguments from the 2017 article, and we'll see why in a minute. The distinction between these two ways of engaging in philosophy hinges on which factor is giving, given teleological priority. According to Sellers, and I'm quoting, Socrates pursues knowledge in order to live a philosophical life, whereas Aristotle lives a philosophical life in order to pursue knowledge. In other words, while both Socrates and Aristotle pick up philosophy as a way of life, the latter does not really count because Aristotle does not um, propose a philosophical life as an end in itself, if I'm understanding it correctly. The issue, Sellers tell us, is one of motivation. Philosophy as a way of life is defined in part by having as its ultimate motivation, I'm putting again, to transform one's way of life. If I understand this correctly, not only is philosophy, it is to be understood as a way of life, a transformative endeavor, but it must also be adopted because of its transformative power. One takes up philosophy to change one's life. I have some problems with this. Um, I disagree with the idea that motivation is a crucial factor for the definition of philosophy as a way of life. And I disagree even more with the notion that transforming one's life can be that definition. I think it is a concomitant effect of engaging in philosophy as a way of life if done correctly and if done successfully. Um, in fact, I would argue, and this is the provocative part, that the notion of trans transformation as motivation contradicts the very nature of philosophy as a process of discovery of cognitive enrichment, since it suggests that either the subject is indifferent to the content of that transformation, so what am I transforming myself into, or that at the outset, at the moment of adoption and throughout the whole engagement with philosophy, the subject is fully aware of where the process of transformation will lead them, thereby eliminating the possibility of surprise, of something different. And so when first embarking on a philosophical way of life, I either do not really care into what my life is going to be transformed, or else I already believe I know what that transformation entails, meaning that I know even before I start what the philosophical way of life is and what the results will be. In both cases, there is, ironically, a collapse of the meaning of philosophy as a lived experience, as a process of discovery to which I overcome my cognitive limitations and thereby become a different kind of person. That's what philosophy does. However, the question of motivation is still one I believe is worth engaging with. It draws attention to the fact that the philosophical way of life is neither a given nor a spontaneous acquisition. No one of their own accord and left to their own devices adopts a philosophical way of life. Philosophy needs a beginning, it needs a trigger, it needs to be chosen or adopted. This is something you can use in can easily lose track of as we discuss what exactly philosophy as a way of life is in its, in its different modalities, and especially when we try to define it in contrast with other ways of engaging with philosophy. For example, philosophy as a university discipline or subject. The question of motivation can instead invite us to think about philosophy as a way of life in contrast with other possible ways of life, and or, if there is such a thing, the spontaneous and assorted flow of experiences that would constitute a life in at random. The question is not whether I ought to study philosophy as an academic discipline or as an alternative adopted as a way of life. Rather, the question is whether or not I should live philosophically, whatever shape that philosophical life might take, that open, or adopt another way of life or no way of life at all. To put it another way, we are invited to think about philosophy not as part of a select group of researchers, teachers, and students of philosophy, but as human beings who have to bear a life whose shape and trajectory is not automatically or spontaneously determined, but is rather susceptible of assuming different shapes and following different trajectories that need to be taken up deliberately and with a certain degree of self-awareness. In short, why adopt philosophy as a way of life rather than anything else whatsoever. Right, 
I believe that this question can be answered perhaps going against the grain by following Adler's advice and re-examining the opinion that Aristotle's conception of knowledge bears no, no relation to the way of life of Donoa in the context of his representation of ways of life. Um, for Adler, the way of life Aristotle proposes is a vice d'accent à la sagesse. Perfect theoria is beyond the ability of humankind. And so the way of life accessible to humans is one of approximation of pursuit of wisdom in that sense of philosophical life with the element of distance from the aspired to goal that the, the, the prefix below often um, implies. But even if unattainable in its perfect and complete form, theoria provides the model of philosophical engagement. What we aspire to and we live towards is the kind of pure contemplation that, uh, of the truth that Aristotle describes in Antiphysics and elsewhere. Now, I'm not going to engage with this particular model. And indeed, I'm going to look at the source that probably, although it's uncertain and it will require some more investigation, provides a slightly different model of the outcome of you know, the perfect, um, uh, happy uh, and good life. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of my time here is to look at this issue from a different angle, taking as my main source, the ugly sister of Aristotle's great treatises on philosophy of human affairs, the Eudemian Ethics. And I do this because the Eudemian Ethics not only contain some re relevant pronouncements about the multiplicity of ways of life human beings may adopt in the potential reasons for their adoption, but also at least in one specific passage, they are integrated into a discussion about what makes life worth living. In other words, in the Eudemian Ethics, Aristotle frames the question about what way of life we ought to adopt and why as a matter of life death, and I think there's nothing more relevant and more radical than that. Uh, uh, right. In the Eudemian Ethics, the three BI appear in the context of the discussion about opinions commonly held, held on the nature of happiness, but they are explicitly introduced as part of a wider array of options, other possible ways of life. And so um, he says these are the, the, there are various modes of life, and some do not lay any claim to well being of the kind under consideration, but again are pursued merely for the sake of things necessary. Um, uh, for instance, the lives devoted to vulgar in mechanic arts and those dealing with business. On the other hand, the things related to happy conduct of life being three terrible uh, translation of the genitive absolute, the things already mentioned as the greatest possible goods for men, excellence, wisdom, and pleasure. We see that there are also three ways of life which all of those who happen to have the resources choose to live, the life of politics, the life of philosophy, and the life of uh, enjoyment. So obviously can't. Now, the contrast is between ways of life pursued out of necessity and those which are pursued for their own sake. Why would one become a blacksmith or a carpenter or a fisherman or a merchant? Because one needs to earn a living. This passage illustrates the ambiguity of the term bios. It can designate the way of life, the way uh, people live, but also what they have to do for a living. The connection is actually very easy to understand as most human beings do not live lives of ease um, and luxury and idleness, they need to work for a living. And so a big chunk of their waking lives is determined by the activities that they are forced to engage in in order to survive. But there are ways of life that go beyond this um, logic of survival, which are available to those people who have the resources, so the exousia, to choose those other ways of life. And this is where the three canonical ways of life come in. So poverty cost, loss of cost, and policy cost. These lives are possible when human beings are not tied up by necessity, by having to do things in order to guarantee their survival. This requires resources, time, and opportunity. And indeed, that others help or take over the burden of survival for us. In the society Aristotle is examining, of course, he's talking about slavery, the forced labor of those who are not free. And this is a crucial factor that affords a small group of people the opportunity to engage in these superior ways of life, so to speak. Um, for example, the passage of politics, therefore all rich people, uh, all people rich enough to be able to avoid personal trouble have a steward who takes 
this office while they themselves engage in politics of philosophy. This he goes even further. He's not just talking about people who have slaves, but you're talking about people rich enough to have a slave to manage your slaves. So you are free not just from the trouble of you know tilling the land and, and selling at the market and cleaning your house. You are freed from the trouble of actually having to manage your people. So one well, sounds wonderful, doesn't it, if you don't think about the lives of other people. Now, this passage of politics is, of course, from the discussion on slavery. And there is, according to Aristotle, a science of applying the labor of slaves, which belongs to the master. But those who have the resources, the wealth, highest you to do the job for them, and as I said, can dedicate themselves to politics or philosophy. You might not you might need not just to have slaves, but actually to have that other slave to run your slaves. The, Thoughts of your of slaves. And so from the very start, um, it seems that we are talking about ways of life that are limited to a small number of people. The two qualifications I think are important. The first that there is nothing in the nature of these ways of life themselves that make them only suitable for a small number of people for this kind of elite, or at least nothing that can be deduced from the contrast with the beyond dedicated to the acquisition of the bare necessity. We will see that there are indeed some qualifications, and in fact, these are quite important and play later. One could, but one could conceive, or at least imagine society where, with the help of certain techniques and devices and systems, the vast majority of people would be free and available to engage in the life of politics, philosophy, and pleasure seeking. In fact, when compared with the society Aristotle lived in, our own affords a much greater number of uh, much greater number of people the means and opportunities to do just that. The free, wealthy man of Aristotle's time used the work of enslaved people to achieve this. He used technology in a more complex division of labor to, to achieve what I consider to be better results. Now, second qualification is very important. Is that even if only a small number of people have the means and opportunity to adopt these ways of life. They are still the ways of life any person with the requisite qualifications would choose if they had the chance. And this is important because we have to, to realize that these are not hobbies. These are not something to do while we wait for our inevitable final encounter with the Grim Reaper. These are the things that we would choose to do if we were given the chance to make that particular choice. And so even, you know, the potter, the blacksmith, the merchant, if they were freed from the necessity of having to, you know, make a living doing those, those particular activities, they would choose a life of pleasure seeking or a life dedicated to philosophy or a life dedicated to politics. That's what Aristotle is trying to convince us of. Now, the reason for this is that even if they are not available to all people due to specific circumstances, they are still the ways of life that allow for the acquisition and enjoyment of those things most people consider to be the most worthy of choice. And they're therefore essential constituents of a happy life. And he's talking about phronesis, and he uses in Eugene ethics the specific term phronesis, at this point, not with the um, um, technical um, uh, load that we find in um, book six of um, the Nicolaitan Ethics, which is book five of the Eugenian Ethics, um, arete, and of course, and of course, pleasure, hedonic. These are the greatest, the greatest goods for us human beings, and therefore the things we would seek to obtain if given a chance. Now, these come into Eugenian Ethics actually quite early on. Um, But to be happy and to live blissfully and finally, so Kalos um, uh, may consist chiefly in three things need to be most desirable. Some people say that wisdom is the greatest good, others excellence, and others um, pleasure. So um, phronesis, arete, and hypone. And then later on, um, a few lines, he says that if we are uh, capable of making that particular choice, we would choose to live pointing at these of at one at least one of these goals and then orient our lives towards those particular goals um and of course when you read that passage you are immediately reminded of the metaphor of the archer pointing to the telos 
in um, um, Nicomachean Nicom ethics. Now, while people might disagree about which one of these goods is the greatest and whether happiness requires all or just one or just some of them, these three are the usual suspects for the role of the greatest goods, and therefore the ultimate object of desire. Happiness will likely involve, in one way or another, the possession of one of these, at least one of them. And since these are the greatest goods, they are pursued by those who are not constrained by having to dedicate their lives to pursuit of the bare necessities of life. Now, Aristotle gives us some more hints about what these three ways of life are about, and this would be by Paul. This is a next passage, to say the least. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to read the translation as it appears on low, and then I'm going to make some remarks on the translation. The translation. Yes, I can. Let's begin up. Right. So, um, and then I'm going to make some some quite um, 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 bad tempered remarks about it. Uh, <laughs> So of these, the philosophical life denotes being concerned with the contemplation of truth. Political life means being occupied with honorable activities, and these are the activities that spring from excellence. And the life of enjoyment is concerned with the pleasures of the body. Now, you will have noticed, if you look at the Greek, Tuton Garo Philosophos Politai Te Prodes in Enai, Kantian Theorian, Ben Peritin Alethean. Right, um, you will notice that in the translation, there's no mention of anything remotely uh, equivalent to Pronesin. So the translator entirely skips the mention of promising. He focuses exclusively on the aspect of theory. And again, it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated um, phrase. Uh, we can interrogate what, what does it mean that maybe phronis in ani? Uh, does ani go with bullet eye or does it go with peri? Um, and uh, why in God's name do we have the Pedicinale Seian, although that's a normal construction of Theoria, uh, and what is the connection between Phronesis and Theoria? There is, um, I've written, I will spare you that, on the, on the particular uh, meaning of Pai, and there are three hypotheses in my opinion, but I will spare you that. The point is that Phronesis is there, and we need to deal with it. Um, and instead of looking at Eugenian ethics as presenting the same kind of possibilities as the Nicomachean ethics, and then adapting our interpretation of Eugenian ethics to fit the Nicomachean ethics, I think we need to be open to the possibility, and I think it's a very clear possibility, and I think that's probably the correct reading, that Eugenian ethics presents a different um, candidate, a different shape of the happy life than we find in Nicomachean ethics. And then we can discuss which one should we think um, is best. But at the end of the day, it is up to us as readers of Aristotle and as philosophers, as the people engaged in these questions, to decide. <laughs> anyway, um, I will spare you the rest of that. So, uh, this is important because it's one of the very few instances of the phrase be a philosopher in Aristotle. I scowl it. The corpus. He never mentions your philosophers, I think, outside of this particular text. If you look at the Nicomachean ethics, it's always pure theoreticos. And if you look at the human ethics, it's never pure theoreticos. And the connection between Pios philosophers and theoria is very unclear. And if you, if you want um, um, a reading experience that makes you think that you're on drugs, I suggest you read book eight of Eugenian ethics. It's just Madness, <laughs> because at the end you really don't know where you are. So <laughs> um, it is very difficult to decide what is at stake in what exactly Aristotle means by phronesis and theoria, and least of all how these two concepts relate to one another in the context of the bios philosophers. These are problems that I cannot present a solution for. Now, the other two BO are apparently more straightforward. So we have the life of politics, which is concerned with beautiful, fine, noble actions, which is not very different from what we find in Nicomachean ethics. And of course, we have the life of pleasure seeking. Um, a big difference is that in Nicomachean ethics, he's very, he's very dismissive of the life of pleasure seeking. He means nobody would 
in her right mind to choose this, whereas in the Athenian ethics, he has more time for it. He does not dismiss it entirely, and one could argue that the final result of the Athenian ethics actually contains elements of the life of pleasure seeking, reinterpreted and modified in a different way. So, however, the discussion of the three PI in the Athenian ethics is tied with another crucial issue. And this is an issue that tends to be overlooked in studies of ancient ethics, what makes life worth living? And as David Matrick explains in his very recently published book, published like in April, this is an issue that is related to the more commonly discussed topic of happiness in good life, the greatest good in life, but that does not entirely overlap with it. At stake is not what the greatest good in life is, the shape of the best possible human life, but rather the threshold and the conditions that make life acceptable or worthy of being chosen. What is the minimum that justifies making life? One could, in theory, conclude that only the maximum is good enough. That is, that no life without at least the potential to achieve the best should even get a look in. But regardless of this possible coincidence, these are formally two distinct issues, two distinct notions. And in fact, as David Matrick shows in his book, there is plenty of evidence for the overall out from the overall output of ancient philosophy to warrant a separate examination. Now, in his chapter on Aristotle, Matrick only briefly considers the evidence from human ethics, in particular, book one, chapter five. What he finds there is the most sustained discussion of the conditions of life worth, the, uh, worth living in the Aristotelian corpus, and that's a quote. And in this passage, we find a discussion of what makes life worth choosing, leading to a series of mostly negative results. What Matcha uh, designates as unconditional worth breakers, that is, life contents whose presence unconditionally make life not worth having. My own reading of the passage, however, inches on how it reflects the old pessimistic tradition that I designate as ancient anti-natalism. I've never found a good way of saying this. And which, are more, which we are more familiar with, mainly through Nietzsche's paraphrasing birth of tragedy, as the wisdom of Silenus. It is best for humans not to be born, and the second best is to die as quickly as possible. Now, I've been working on this topic for quite some time, and there is still a lot more to go, and I will hopefully be publishing at some point a monograph on this topic. So I don't want to give too much away now. But the connection with ancient natalism is clear, first of all, from how Aristotle framed the question. Uh, while there are many different things as to which it is easy to make a right judgment, this is especially the case with one which about everybody thinks that is very easy to judge and that everyone can decide the question which of the things contained in being the lives chosen and which when somebody attained it would satisfy that desire. So why we, um, what do we want in life? For many of life's events are such that they cause life to be thrown away. For instance, diseases, excessive pains and storms. So that it is clear that on account of these things anyway, it would actually be preferable if some, someone, someone offered the choice not to be born at all. The question is complex. So he's talking about the contents of life that we ought to be chosen by us and would actually satisfy our desire. So he's asking what we want in life. And then he seems to think, change the subject. And lots of scholars think he basically changed the subject and become entirely complex by this. Uh, and starts talking about all those things that, far from being worthy of choice, would have the effect of making us choose not to be alive at all. The assumption, of course, is that being alive has a conditional value that depends on what life contains. Um, under certain circumstances, we are better off not being alive. The question goes from the contents that we desire in life to the contents that make life itself undesirable and indeed to be rejected. Um, but the key moment is the very last sentence in this passage. The matter is not simply of throwing one's, one's life away, but actually one of preferring not to have been born at all, if we could ever have had a chance. And then he discusses the, poss the possibilities and conditions, and it's um, a complicated discussion, but all of this is framed, or at least indeed um, sandwiched, by two anecdotes involving the philosopher Anaxagoras. We're going to look at those passages. Um, this is after he introduces the three ways of life. 
Owing to this, different people give the name of the Hapi to different persons, as was said before too. And Anaxagoras, when asked who is the happiest man, said none of those who you think, and you would seem to be an odd sort of person, Apopos, that's what the term that he uses. Um, and then uh, Aristotle makes some editorial comments on what um, Anaxagoras might have been hinting at, um, and we're not going to bother with that at the moment. Now, the setup is indeed a recurring trope in Greek culture. So we have a wise man, a sage, a figure of wisdom. Somebody asks that person a specific question, usually has to do with the superlative, what is the best for, for, for humankind, what is the greatest, what is the, the strongest, and so on and so forth. And then the wise person gives an answer that often is, goes against the grain, that is surprising, that makes the questioner revise their own assumptions. And that's basically what I think is going on here. And of course, we're not given Anaxagoras' actual reply, and he seems quite coy in relation to what that might be. Um, of course, this is used to illustrate the diversity of the people. Um, but I think um, we should look at the second appearance of Anaxagoras. Now, it is said that when somebody persists in putting various difficulties, difficulties of this sort to Anaxagoras, and with on asking for the sake of what one would choose to be born rather than not, he replied by saying, for the sake of contemplating the sky, the heaven, and the whole order of the universe. Again, let's put aside the answer. Let's focus on the question. For the sake of what, Anaxagoras is asked, would somebody choose to be born rather than not? Notice the conditional formulation. If somebody offers a choice for the sake of what would someone choose? Aristotle is inviting us to imagine an impossible situation, a prenatal scenario in which we are free to decide on whether we get to be born or not. My reading of the passage is that he is engaging in a thought experiment which takes as its basic assumption the qualified version of the antinatalist thesis. Considering that prima facie, life is not worth choosing, if there are any, is there any life content, any possibility that could justify choosing to be born instead of not being? In other words, is there anything in life that could overcome the all canceling or annihilating proposition that we thought that we would all be better off not having been born at all? This, I think, has to be read together with the first Anaxagoras anecdote. And I think it makes sense to think of two Anaxagoras anecdotes as, in fact, being two parts of one extended anecdote, with the discussion in the middle standing for the imagined philosophical back and forth between Anaxagoras and the anonymous question element. It is a riddle of the superlative with a dialectical discussion. If we take two anecdotes together, then we can see that the second question is in fact a reformulation of the first. It goes from who is the happiest person to for the sake of what would one choose to be born rather than not being born. A transition like this only makes sense if it is assumed that anything short of happiness would make life worth it. And one would not choose to be born for anything other than best. Anything less than that. Now, what happens between these two questions is a reframing of the question of the maximum or the superlative within a discussion that we would normally understand as one about minimus. What is enough to make life worth living? And of course, modern scholars, again, become quite perplex by this particular question. For example, Woods seems to become genuinely confused. What could the bare minimum have to do with making oh, the good? Sorry, what could the bare minimum to make life livable have to do with the search for the good and the, the best life? I think this misses the point. But we should not dismiss the perplexity, because these are indeed two different questions. But it is clear, nevertheless, that Aristotle brings the two questions together in this part of the human ethics. The two questions are virtually merged. What allows for this merger is the assumption of the anti-natalist stance as an immunity. Um, then I 
I'm, I'm probably going to skip this bit. Um, I tried to explain how the formula in uh, the anecdote for Anaxagoras actually uh, maps to the formula of the um, uh, in uh, the story told in the fragment of Aristotle about the capture of Silenus by uh, King Midas. There was a moment of hesitation, and then the answer is given. But the answer, of course, is completely different because one of the answer, the answer for Silenus, um, uh, the answer by Silenus just closes the debate. So anti-natalism basically Jake says there's no more to discuss. And because this is the answer, there is nothing in life that will make life, life worth living. Whereas, as used by Aristotle, it's the beginning of a discussion because it is assumed conditionally, not as the final word on anything else. The antinatalist stance therefore constitutes a radical departure point for any questioning about what the happiness is. The question is no longer what is the best thing in life, or if we take happiness to be an activity, what is the best use I can make of the time I have been given? If that was the case, failure to acquire the best or to engage in the best activity would result in a life that is not happy, but would perhaps not be catastrophic. Because many of us have to make do with mediocre lives and even with unhappy lives. But once the question is reframed from the point of view of the antinatalist stance, Failure to achieve happiness becomes catastrophic. The question is, since life is not worth living without X, what is X? And if X is happiness, whatever that might be, then a life without happiness is a life that ought not to be desired, accepted, or endured. It becomes a matter of life. Now, it will not surprise you that um, um, I'm going to skip this because for a matter of time, um, there is a, um, the, the analysis is not really a positive analysis in the sense that we don't get positive results unless we try to extract them. So the results are always negative. So um, he excludes the possibility of, of being born to live like a child or to uh, live a life that experiences neither pleasure nor pain and so on and so forth. And so what we have to do through the analysis is to get to a kind of um, sketch of what that kind of life ought to be. And I've actually you know, done the work for that. And I found four particular factors. And those are what that um, the thing for the sake of which we would choose to be born rather than not be born must, one, be an end in itself, two, be, sustained, be uh, sustainable for an extended period of time, three, be in conformity with the normative conception of human nature, so basically be uh, an adult Greek non-enslaved male, uh, because the, the idea of scala naturae, and indeed the idea of males, free males, free Greek males, being superior from, to uh, everybody else because they are the perfect example of, of the actualization of the potentialities that are, that are incumbent in uh, human nature um, is assumed throughout this whole analysis. Um, and four, it has to involve pleasure in some capacity, although pleasure is always problematic in Aristotle. Of course, it will not surprise you that the possibilities that emerge from this experiment are none other than the three ways of life that I've mentioned before. And although in the anecdote Anaxagoras is committed to Pius Philosophos, and indeed a version of Pius Philosophos, and involves very specifically the contemplation of the heaven, all that, Aristotle himself leaves open the possibility that any of the other two might correspond to happiness. Pius Apostokos, once again, is problematic. But unlike the Nicomachean ethics, it is not dismissed out of hand as a possible candidate. Pius Poeticos is the object of further clarification, which is it goes more or less um, similar terms as Nicomachean ethics, more or less. Um, and of course, um, um, all of them remain standing at the end of this particular bit of ethics. Now, you will no doubt remember that I started this by now along the discourse by engaging with um, um, Seller's 2017 article on the particular topic of motivation. So while I reject the idea that motivation should be seen as a crucial factor for defining philosophy as a way of life, it is nonetheless important to understand why such a way of life ought to be adopted. 
since it is not innate or spontaneous. The thought experiment we find in TV ethics goes some way to clarify what that motivation could be. The Beast Philosophers is not merely a way of life one may or may not adopt, because it is happiness itself, or at the very least, one of the candidates to being happiness itself. Why then, should, why then should we choose to live philosophically? Because we want to be happy. And if we accept, and this is a big age, that only happiness is enough to justify our being alive, then we must live philosophically or else accept uh, that we have no valid reason to live at all. And of course, this leads us to the famous passage of Protecticus. So one must either be philosophy or say goodbye to life, or goodbye to living, and go away from here, since everything else at least seems in a way to be lots of trash and nonsense. For our current discussion, such a stance is particularly problematic because while the prenatal standpoint allows us to consider the different life possibilities untethered from the constraints of actual life, as I, um, uh, they are not untethered from Aristotle's normative conceptions about human nature and its proper task. The consequence, of course, is that both happiness and what makes life worth living might be default, by default unreachable for the vast majority of human beings. All those that do not happen to be adult, male, Greek, and non-enslaved, and perhaps for that matter, constrained by having to attend to the bare necessities of life. And if we take this without qualification, then as far as I can tell, not a single person in this room and indeed watching this via Zoom would be capable of achieving um, what makes life worth living. We would all, be condemned to living worthless and meaningless lives while at the same time desiring and yearning for those very things that would make our lives worth, uh, worthful and meaningful. And since those very things are by our own constitution out of our reach, it is not like I can become Greek all of a sudden, um, we would be condemned to live uh, to, to lives of unredeemable frustration. Silenus would have been wise indeed. Now, my reading of the Eugenian ethics passage does not go as far for a number of reasons. First of all, I believe antinatalism is just a kind of immunitic stance, um, part of his methodology at this point. In fact, it is hard to see how uh, the antinatalist in action, uh, um, how it goes into the rest of the Eugenian ethics outside this particular context, although, of course, this warrants further investigation. And of course, um, if we um, um, look at uh, Nash's work, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, provides compelling evidence for the thesis that Aristotle does believe that life itself has worth in and of itself. There are several passages in Aristotle where he says that quite an ambiguous, um, sufficient, uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient work to make it worth choosing even if we are not happy. Secondly, within the narrow scope of this thought experiment, no decision is made regarding which of the three lives is more worthy of choice. So at the end of the thought experiment, the life of pleasure in the political life still stand as potential alternatives to the philosophical life. So in the end, we still have a multiplicity of possibilities. And indeed, if we have these three possibilities, we might come up with a fourth or a fifth. We should not believe that Aristotle has a monopoly in philosophical imagination, like the Greeks. So how do we choose between the candidates? The question about the connection between the thought experiment and the rest of the ethical discussion in Eugenian ethics is left open. Does the bios politikos correspond to life of virtue as understood in the rest of um, the book? Does bios philosophos correspond to life dedicated to theoria in particular, or some of the doubts of philosophy? And what, if any, is the connection between theoria and arete? Eudemian ethics provides us some tantalizing clues about this, but of course I'm not going to talk about it because I want you to what it's saying. But even if we accept that bios philosophos consists only in theoria, then theoria is presented as something essential, something crucial, something we could not live without. Although ultimately it seems that Aristotle leaves behind the radical approach I've been talking about, it at least shows that such a perspective is conceivable and it invites us to perhaps rethink the role theoria might play in our discussions about philosophy and ethics of life. Perhaps it's not so much a matter of seeing how philosophy can fit to our lives and help us live happier and fuller lives. Perhaps philosophy is the only possible or valid or even livable life, or at least 
one of the narrow, uh, the narrow field of candidates for that. And if that is the case, everything else should be subordinate to it in help, or at least not in that it's. Thanks a lot, Fabio, for the great talk. And now we have uh, Antonio with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I've um, read uh, a proto archive version of this paper. I have some 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 comments mm -hmm. on it. First, on on phronesis. It, it is true that Aristotle, even in the legal making ethics, doesn't supply the 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 the, the word as a, a terminus technicus all, all, all over. Um, but uh, this, yeah. So um, maybe wisdom is a very very wrong translation yeah. because you know maybe from aprosune, phronesis, so forth. You know maybe dimension or amensia or something mm -hmm. like this has to do mindful having in mind. Uh, waking up, whatever, but wisdom, not yeah. So, but my 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 problem with this this with the solution of the universal uh, and equivocal uh, answering for the theoretical uh, life as. Resolving the equation of uh, happiness mm. is that um, Aristotle himself in the Corpus Aristotelico is, is uh, very ambiguous about it. Even somebody like Sir David Ross yeah. says that uh, there's a practical motivation even in the metaphysics. Yeah. It is co erogeno. So it is praxis that. Uh, bounds or uh, grounds the very first sentence of the metaphysics. So, uh, if somebody is unsuspicious, as Sir David Ross, not highly read, right, Sir David Ross says that, um, we need to, to read it um, into it as very, very cautious. But the problem for me is how can we read eudaimonia and happiness? Uh, a concept that is so broad, and he says it is energia, uh, it is energia, it is psychis, katharite, katharite, yeah. And it is not something that you can, uh, can reduce simply to pleasure. Of course, it is very sexy, and I want it. <laughs> I want it, of course, I want it. It is an energia. And it comes from the psyche. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it isn't grounded in a world content. It is not in a vacation. So it is something that uh, it's going on with me, comes from me. Uh, I want it. Uh, what it is, I don't know. Maybe it is what he says. Uh, it is chicane ho era. It is yeah. to find what one loves. Maybe. It is sexy as a population. So it is not hypertrophia. No. So it is not Ariston, it is not Tokariston, it is not a superlative. It is something that has to do with love or, or anything like this formulation. So my, 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 my question is either theoria uh, is something that I find in Diagoge, Kai like Phronesis in the metaphysics. So that what's going on there is a trans, it is something that I'm, 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 I'm getting high in, and it's so good to be there. And I, I, it's difficult to explain that. Um, or uh, it's not intellectual. Mm -hmm. It's not participated in congresses. It's not being publishing books, although it's, it can be sexy. Um, and even if it is so, it's it is grounded in practical reasons, and it it has to do with pleasure. Mm -hmm. So my, my answer is, if it is so, 
Teoría es praxis. That reminds me of a passage in politics. I can't remember exactly where it is, but there's a passage in politics that is this, where he's discussing um, um, the um, opposition between uh, theoria and praxis. And he says something that even in theoria, there's a praxis because you need to, you know, move the different parts of the soul. There is activity there. And so the opposition between a theory and a praxis is probably an, oppos an opposition that is not as radical as we tend to do, especially if we associate praxis with, you know, the kind of life of the, of the um, uh, uh, practical uh, 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 virtues, for example, in like Mickey and Ethics. Um, and yes, I agree that Aristotle is incredibly ambiguous and he seems to be all over the place. And it doesn't really surprise me because it's a very, very complicated issue. Um, and we have to realize that no matter how he might at some, at some point describe the life of Theoria as that kind of otherworldly, divine kind of life, it is, has to be rooted in our actual life as a human being. And although we might talk about in, in um, kind of like the kinetics of the divine within us, of that divine nature within us, and therefore that's the divine nature that we should live uh, in conformity with, the fact is we still, you know, have to put our trousers on one leg at a time. We need to have our little meals. We need to drink water. We need to live a life. And all the moments that might lead to theoria are lived here in this rooted, embodied life. I must confess that any, every time that I read descriptions of what a life of theory might be, either Plato, Aristotle, or elsewhere, my impression is that I don't think they know what they're talking about. I have no reason to believe that Aristotle or Plato ever had a moment of theory as it is described, say, in the symposium or, um, uh, or uh, in Book 10 and Rikomi Kinetics. I think they might be extrapolating dialectically from what it ought to be. I'm not sure there was an actual experience there. I disagree with you. I disagree with you. You think they have that experience? I'm in Bobby Stone. They are getting high. Okay. <laughs> 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 We have a John. Yeah, um, thank you very much. That was really, really rich and really interesting. Um, so, as you alluded to, um, I've kind of revisited this question of, of Aristotle more recently, and some of you may have heard me talk about it, and a couple of you have, have, have read it as well. Um, and ironically, I kind of think this is less a question about how to interpret Aristotle and more a question about how to interpret Hado, right? Yeah. The question isn't what's going on in Aristotle, although it's rich and complex and there's lots for us to argue about. It's more, how do we want to understand philosophy as a way of life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and that seems to be the issue. So, for instance, at the end of this paper I wrote on Aristotle, um, my kind of conclusion was, well, there are certain places where Hadot says that philosophy's way of life is fundamentally a practice. Yeah. It's that contrast between a practice or an activity versus a mere discourse. And if that's how we're defining philosophy's way of life, then Aristotle bits, right? Aristotle's talking about thought as a practice, as an activity, right? Being as an activity, yeah. right? So, if that's what philosophy is, where life is, Aristotle thinks that's fine. But elsewhere, Hado will say, and I'm thinking of the quotation from his book on Goethe that I had up on the slide yesterday. He said, the goal of philosophy as a way of life is transformation. Mm -hmm. It's to form oneself. And that seems to put that question of motivation back on the table. So I think, you know, Hado says different things in different places. So, I mean, this is a great question for this whole conference, right? Not, not a question for you, it's a great question for all of us, right? How do we want to define philosophy as way of life? Yeah. Are we thinking of a practice or are we thinking about a goal of, of self transformation? I, as you probably will have gathered from, said it, I yeah. disagree with the idea that it is a goal. If I, if I don't said it and I disagree with it. I don't think it can be constituted as a goal because it's too open ended. Regard transformation into what? What am I looking at? Um, I'm more sympathetic to the idea of 
philosophy being a process, a constant um, building, a constant discovery. And I understand that might not fit um, um, the projects that uh, what you can identify as the biologistic schools, where after at least a certain period of discussion, you have a certain more or less, and I'm being quite um, uh, cagey about it, settled view of the world, of what life is about, and then you can engage in that kind of discussion and you adopt and you digest um, 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 those, particular, those particular propositions and that becomes part of your life. But again, as was said, you know, in the discussion from, from the previous paper, even that there's the, you know, those the, that back and forth, those changes, they are not um, um, uh, static um, um, schools. They're not static sets of propositions. Um, and so I think that if we are to propose philosophy as a way of life, I think it makes more sense, or at least I'm more sympathetic with the idea of looking at it as an attitude, more as more than a constituted project. And I think I'm more sympathetic with the idea of it being open-ended more than a specific goal. Because again, if the goal is to transform oneself, transform oneself into what? And transformation can take all sorts of different shapes in forms. So I'm more sympathetic to an Aristotelian perspective where you have that particular goal, you might not know exactly what it is, it's dronesis, and you translate it out as you will, it's theoria, and we're working towards it. And there's that idea of distance, and there's that idea of trying to reach it, and that then becomes the lodestar of your life, and all the contents and all the actions and all the choices of your life are then reformed by that. That's, I think, makes, and that would be, if, and that would be a philosophical way of life, if indeed, you know, rejected is wisdom or knowledge or truth or whatever. Thank you, Bob. This is a question for a bit of ignorance, really. Um, the, the, the three, the three um, ways of life, political, philosophical, and um, uh, enjoy or pleasurable, doesn't seem to be much multiplicity for me. Uh, what is, is there any mention of, and, uh, of being an artist as a, as a way of life, or being a hermit, the really aesthetic as a way of life, or even a designer or architect as a way of life? So why is he, and they're all for me, extremely transformative experience, mm -hmm. the, the idea of the transformation. And um, this is literally it's kind of overcoming now, uh, cutting through the other. But so, why does it just those three? And does he ever talk about it? Um, uh, it's, so I think it's culturally determined. Um, um, so, these, there's a discussion of how old this particular kind of trope, and I call it a trope of Greek culture. Indeed, it's a trope of Greek culture that then is taken up by all sorts of different um, um, thinkers, um, so for example, Cicero and so on. Um, um, and um, it's the idea precisely that you have three particular goals. These are the main goals, the things that people would look at, the ones that are actually worth choosing. Um, and it's culturally determined in that way. But um, I mean, all the possibilities that you've presented would be possibilities that would have been either unknown to Greek culture or would make no sense within Greek culture. So a hermit would make no sense whatsoever. The idea of living alone on your own it's a nightmare culture. It's like, it's, it would, it's probably be the closest of, probably the ultimate punishment if you think so, for example, um, the figure of Philoctetus uh, uh, left alone in um, uh, a deserted island in complete and utter agony. And it's not just the wound that hurts him, it's the abandonment, it's the isolation. Um, if you think about, you know, those kinds of creative, uh, endeavors. I mean, if you're working with your hands, uh, I don't think Aristotle has much uh, consideration for a person like that. Uh, if you are a poet, more so. But then again, um, would they consider that as a kind of way of life in this way? Um, they would probably think that if you are a poet, you either are somehow in search of wisdom, 
and um, you are a kind of spokesperson of the kind of divine wisdom that is imparted to you as a kind of in your relationship with the muses, or they will think of you as somebody that, whose objective in life is to acquire fame in the admiration of others, or indeed you take it as a kind of profession, as a kind of entryway into a life of luxury and uh, um, 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 acquisition. For example, if you become the pet of a tyrant in the archaic era. So there is not a lot of space for other kinds of ways of life in the way Aristotle, Aristotle and other uh, ancient thinkers put, put it. But of course, when we engage in this sort of, of, of discussion, we could or we can understand other ways of life. And we can try to figure out the internal logic and the kind of system of uh, ends and means that are part of those other possible ways of life. So we can ex exercise our own creative imagination in the context of ancient Greek culture. And again, most of those possibilities that are presented would have been entirely alien to that because it's a different paradigm. It's a different paradigm. Thanks a lot, uh, Martha. Thanks so much. That was uh, really interesting. Is this so? Yeah, so uh, I have a comment and a, a question. A comment on uh, motivation. Thank you for bringing that uh, up. I agree with you, and I think that the, the idea of motivation is a crucial aspect in the characterization of philosophers, where why is a problematic yeah. uh, factor. And I have a um, ongoing discussion with uh, with John uh, because you think uh, it is really important, both in this article you put in yeah. in this chapter on Aristotle, motivation plays a Important role in, in this um, I find it problematic first because you can never know actually what is the motivation of the author. That's my main, my first argument. In the end, you cannot know with which motivation the author wrote or not. And secondly, perhaps most importantly, I think it is pretty irrelevant for the transformative effect it has or not on the reader. Not mainly it affects transformity or not, uh, it's nothing to do with the intention of the author, I mean. mm -hmm. Because the author, I, I, I might be reading Marcus Aurelius and be totally untouched by it and, and might not change at all my life, or I can be a teacher of soilism and <laughs> teach at all the doctrines, everything, mm -hmm. know by heart, meditations, and be exactly as I was, and then I, I can read a philosopher who had no intention to change my life and I'm just deeply affected and I see things otherwise. So this was common. Uh, the question was related to choice, which is somehow connected. I wonder how, to which extent do we really choose philosophy? Um, and that's perhaps connected with the with Elder's presentation and the discussion that uh, was brought about by it. Uh, uh, philosophy is somehow the consequence of having our previous world somehow destroyed or in ruin of our system of beliefs breaking somehow. And that's something that happens to us, isn't it? Nobody chooses that they destroy one's world to start with a new. So I don't think there is a, a neutral situation where we justify it. Uh, that we want a philosophical life and not yet some other. And in some way, we are compared to children. And I'm not saying names, <laughs> but the person who's present here, <laughs> in one of my first lectures in this place. <laughs> I remember uh, being told that there was no way back, that uh, we could still not leave. Uh, so we could still choose to leave. We were still in time to leave. Uh, and we were warned, uh, be careful, there is no way back. To contextualize, um, I'm sure. Uh, if, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the vast majority of people here haven't done the undergrad in philosophy in this place. It is very existentially draw a drain. <laughs> it is very intense. It is very intense. Um, 
<laughs> so I could say that uh, a lot of people, which shall remain nameless because they are present here, <laughs> make the point that philosophy is not simply a matter of discourse, but is something that has to touch you. And again, this is something that if you took it seriously, stays with you probably for the rest of your life. Uh, <laughs> life. And I agree with you. Yes, I think you are right in part in the idea that it has it, it comes from having your um, um, how did you put it? The world destroys. It is a possibility. I think it is a way of, 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 of getting there. But I think there are other more cheerful ways. Of getting there. Uh, and that's one of the things actually has to do with with the question that I wanted to ask Albert about, about the possibility, because there's an insistence on the disturbance, on the uh, um, um, wrecking of one's life, of how uncomfortable it is, and it's a kind of way of trying to deal with that discomfort. And I'm discomfort of probably too mild the word. But there is always also the pleasure, the interest, the fascination, the wonderment that comes with discovering suddenly that there is that there are other ways of thinking about the world that you probably couldn't even imagine before you were introduced to them. And so there's a, a, an idea of the um, fascination of that novelty, that thing that emerges in your life. Not something that necessarily destroys what came before, because the conclusion might be that a lot of your assumptions might have been correct, that you might have been living a life that is worthwhile and so on and so forth. But it adds that extra dimension where you open your eyes to why that was right. Open your eye, but open your eyes to those other possibilities that come that and enrich your life in a different way. So, I mean, it is not necessarily the result of a destruction. It might be the result of an enrichment. The two are not incompatible, I would say. And both of them might happen at different moments and they might, you know, cross fertilize. Um, so I have a more cheerful view of it, although I write about life not being worth living. I have a much in the more I, I study the matter, more the more cheerful I get. I get because I'm a contrarian. So if you want to put me down, I get, you know, <laughs> it cheers me up. Um, and so I'm not, I don't think it's necessarily that. But if it's a choice, probably not in the way you're thinking. But of course, the way Aristotle puts it, it is a choice because Aristotle, at least in this passage, he abstracts from all of that. It's pure choice. Would you choose it? Putting aside everything else, all the other constraints. Uh, we have Emily, then Martello, then we have to. Uh, maybe there is also a question in the sort of, but uh, I'll check it out. So I'll, I'll be very quick. It's yeah. an observation on these kind of building comments. Oh. Oh, I can be just loud too. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, I sometimes think that we circle around uh, other kinds of philo classical philosophical issues and philosophy as a way of life. Like, what do we mean by choice? What do we mean about intentionality? What do we mean by authorial intent? And Hado, like the rest of us, struggles with these issues, and they're not easy ones. Like the, the only one I was thinking about, just to that last point you made, is thinking about Hado at other times talks about the conversion experience, the philosophy yeah. happening first, and the justification coming after. Yeah. In a you know very William James sort of, at least reminds me of a William James friendly sort of interpretation. That can pay with um, some. Interesting connection there, but I thought the point you brought out there is interesting on the one. I think there's a difference between saying, how do you say it? We can choose a way of life without justifying it. Maybe two different things, how we justify the choice and choosing the choice. And then both the, I think that kind of begs the question, we really have to ask her, what does cognitive choice versus existential choice yeah. versus determined choice yeah. begin and end. And these are really hard questions and philosophers, the, the choice of philosophy doesn't escape the problems that we kind of circle around in other aspects of philosophical thinking. So it's not an answer, but I think you've actually brought it up a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like even a, a big one, which I think many of us experience is 
uh, and a very practical one of I don't know if I could do anything else yeah. exactly. Does that mean then that I chose it, you know, despite the frustrations of the amount of money I make and everything else? And anyway, I think your presentation highlights that kind of determinism question that's very hard about the philosophical life. So thank you and Andy talk to Matt. We can like the last question. Yeah, very quickly, yeah. just a very brief observation. Um, is this working? Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. No, no, I, we shouldn't forget that in antiquity was an entire literary genre that was meant precisely to convince people yeah. to convert yeah. to form. Okay. And we yeah. have there a perfect example. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, that's it now. Yeah. That's just yeah. Um, yeah, there was the there was the assumption is this is the the best way of life, and you should choose it for these and other reasons. But the simple fact that you actually need a literary genre telling you that's why it's because it's not obvious. Yeah, the vast majority of people will think the vast majority of people will say, like Foy Poloi in the 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 Fido, that you're better off dead, that you're already dead. This is not the way of living one's life. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, how do you answer that? You answer that by showing that in actuality, what you think that is the best life, the normal life, so to speak, the non philosophical life, actually has more problems, as actually fails in some fundamental way that only the philosophical life can actually um, answer. I mean, they might be more or less convincing, but that's what they're trying to do. And the fact that there is a literary genre indicates that it is problematic. Otherwise, everybody would agree with it and people will just carry on. Um, as to the idea of could we do anything else, that is part of the transformative effect of it, I think. It transforms you, or it has the potential to transform you in such a way that you probably cannot abandon it. And even if you abandon it, there's something lacking. And one of the things that actually I have a broad interest in is in all why, and if you look, for example, at the, the, the role of biography by the ancient philosophers, why they, at their different moments and for different reasons, they decided or they became philosophers. And even more interesting for me is those who were offered the opportunity that, and then abandoned it for different reasons. Perfect example, the, 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 the um, um, uh, verbal example are Sabiades, for example, or say Critias, or what's his name, Plato's brother in the beginning of the um, Parmenides. Uh, why did they decide to become politicians instead of philosophers? Why did they decide to make their lives to horse rearing instead of becoming philosophers? <laughs> and I think, I think that would be a fertile. Um, 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 uh, avenue for investigation. Thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you.